Welcome. Welcome everybody to our final Teaching Artist Tuesday webinar of the season. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Kathleen Collier. I'm the Arts and Education Director and Accessibility Coordinator at the North Panel Arts Council. And I'm joined here with um, my collaborator, Lenora Hammonds. Um, who is the director of the Teaching Artist Certificate Program at North Carolina Central University. Before we dive in, because I'm really excited about today's topic, I just wanted to go over a few just general Zoom kind of 101 things to consider. Feel free throughout today's webinar to put any questions into the chat box. Uh, we're, we're more than happy to make sure those get shared with our fantastic guest panelists. This um, webinar will be recorded and archived on the Teaching Artist Certificate webpage in the weeks ahead. So feel free to share this um, webinar link with any colleagues or artist networks as well. And then we are also being live streamed to North Carolina Central University's YouTube channel. So just a few bits and pieces there. With regards to today's session topic, we are gonna be connecting with teaching artists and arts administrators whose work and artistic practice integrates resiliency and intercultural connections. Towards the end of today's webinar, I'm also excited to share with you information regarding resources and grant opportunities for teaching artists with the North Carolina Arts Council and always happy to just continue that discussion um, offline as well. But without further ado, I'm happy to um, hand it over to my colleague, Lenora. Thank you, Kathleen. Hi, everyone. I hope you are well. We are in, in, you're in store for a really wonderful treat because we have fantastic, very dynamic teaching artists with us today. Um, I am in no particular order. I'm going to introduce you to them. First is Kimberly Pierce Cartwright a North Carolinian artist, be, she began exploring fiber after becoming a member of the African-American quilt circle in Durham, North Carolina. The first quilt she ever made with African-American quilt circle was featured in the international magazine Quilt Mania. Her work has also been featured in Quilting Arts Magazine, an international publication, and in museums. Kimberly enjoys sharing her passion through her artwork and classes where she continues to perfect her design and construction processes to create unique art. This is a working journalist who holds a BA in radio, television, and film from Shaw University in Raleigh, North Carolina. She also holds an MA in public affairs reporting from the University of Illinois at Springfield. Welcome Kimberly Pierce Cartwright. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Our next guest will be Kimberly Cheatham, serves as the outreach coordinator within the Office of Institutional Diversity and Inclusion at UNC Wilmington, one of the sister schools of NCCU. In this role, she works with organizations and youth to identify and explore creative opportunities to move beyond barriers for success. She has almost 20 years as a higher education professional and previous roles at the university include director of the pre-college program and Senior Assistant Director within the Office of Scholarships and Financial Aid. She credits a collaborative campus and community environment for career highlights, including the creation of the university's only four-year scholarship program, SOAR Ambassador Program, and the Just Us Art Initiative. She holds a BA in Political Science, an MA in Organizational Management, and a Graduate Certificate in Youth Development and Leadership. Let's welcome Kimberly Cheatham. <clears throat> Thank you, I'm happy to be here. So happy to have you. And last but not least, Angel Iset Dozier has been cultivating her skills as a conceptual artist and curator through Be Connected Durham since 2014. After contributing to an educational curriculum that cemented the authentic storytelling of Michael Brown's death at the inaugural Black Lives Matter National Convening in Ferguson, Missouri, artists, organizers, cultural workers, education, law, and medical professionals made a commitment to return home and implement policy, procedures, and programs that encouraged Black, Indigenous, and people of color, BIPOC, to move through trauma in various mediums of artistic expression as root medicine, affecting real, lasting change. 
since founding Be Connected Durham with the presentation called The Experiment, Angel Iset has recruited artistic practitioners and cultural workers to collaborate on more than 150 community arts events. 85% have been to sold out audiences. Angel Iset's experience as a kinesiology researchist and world languages educator tasked with integrating science, mathematics, technology, and the arts across K-12 disciplines and learning intelligences culminate in the Be Connected Method, an artistically prescriptive concept design method called space programming. Space programming, a process that allows access to the abstract elements and liminal space not readily seen and connects clientele to what is often missing in traditional process, procedure, programming, and policy development stems from her coming of age during the golden era of hip hop. The ultimate frame of reference whose prescriptive healing power has been affecting real lasting change all over the globe for almost five decades. And I have to add and take the liberty to add to her beautiful biography that she is an alum of NCCU's Teaching Artist Certificate Program. Please welcome Angel Iset Dozier. Thank you. I'm really excited about talking about my work. And I just want to say, you know, if they, if I show emotion, that's just who I am. I'm perfectly fine. I want to acknowledge that I am wearing a piece of art by Kimberly Pierce Cartwright um, with regard to how beautiful and just next level these pieces are. And so I just want y'all to check that out <laughs> in terms of the material, the design, the flow of energy. And I'm grateful to you, Kimberly, for this piece. I'm getting a little full when I saw that you were wearing them. I was like, oh my gosh, she's wearing my earrings. So thank you for honoring me that way. I appreciate it very much. Awesome. So I am going to uh, turn it over to Kathleen. Kathleen, you have the first question for our lovely panelists. Thank you. So resiliency is an important life skill and it's, it's something that we continue to build and develop throughout our lives. We all know from both personal experience and from national studies that the arts provide a platform for people to do better to better manage and tolerate uncomfortable emotions, develop creative thinking and problem solving skills, and promote self-reflection and confidence. With this all being said, how do you integrate resiliency within your own practice? I'll take it. Um, first of all, thank you so much for having me again. And when I think about resiliency in my own practice, it means that I have to stay focused on the now and I have to keep planning for the future. And it's an ongoing process from conception that I have to do the work, I have to um, do the production, the marketing, then I have to show, then I have to repeat, and then I have to work in some time to teach as well. And I have to be flexible. I have to be very ready to take on any opportunities that come my way to show my work or to talk about my work like I'm doing here. Also, for the last couple of years, I've um, incorporated more themes of justice into my pieces. And there's a whole other definition of resiliency in, in, in that. Um, I work to show the brilliance of African-Americans who have faced insurmountable odds to rise above their station as enslaved people to become leaders in communities. And right now, some of my work is on display at the National Museum of Art here in Durham called Reckoning and Resilience, the Art of North Carolina Now. And I'm so proud to be a part of that show. Um, work from 30 artists is on display at the museum, and it is quite a show. If you haven't gone to see it, please, by all means, make a date to go. Three of my quilts are in that show. Um, the first one is called The Opulent Injustice of Fannie Lou Hamer. 
Um, we know her as a voting rights activist, as a freedom fighter. She was born in 1917 in Montgomery County, Mississippi. And believe it or not, she was the 20th child of sharecroppers. She's the baby of the bunch of um, Luella and James Townsend. Another one of my quilts is a tribute to Shirley Chisholm. She was the first African-American woman in Congress in 1968. And she was the first woman in African-American to seek the nomination for the president of the United States from um, both major political parties. And then lastly, I have a quilt called North Star in the exhibit that points to the direction that enslaved people were told to go in order to have freedom. And um, I'm gonna read what the curators are saying about this work. After two years marked by global pandemic, political chaos, ongoing deadly racism and environmental injustice, the need to re-examine ourselves and the world around us has never been more urgent. The artists included in this exhibition invite us to reckon with hard truths, seek healing in collective reflection and demand transformative action. I am so blessed to be a part of this project and um, the show goes on until July the 10th mark your calendars, and I hope all of you can go by and see it before it's gone. Well, I regret that I'm not in Durham because I would really want to see that. That sounds beautiful. I'll share next, um, Kathleen. Um, for me, resilience in my personal practice starts with my daily routine. I, I call it a ritual, really. Um, I, it starts in the morning before I get out of bed. I do meditation and I start to ground myself. Next is a journey outside for walk in nature, um, more breathing exercises, connecting just to the beauty that is surrounding me and offering gratitude is very important to me. And those things, help me to ground and set my day. And I started that practice during the pandemic because before then I was just on a rat race. You know, it was a wheel, just never ending. So the pandemic has taught me that part that I was missing, it's brought that back to the surface for me. And once that part of my day is over, and I start this process of work, inevitably life will happen. <laughs> and that will try to get me off course from that grounding place that I started with. And it's at that time that I venture back to those moments earlier in the morning. And I then start to just recall that sense of peace and I separate whatever is going on at the moment from the individuals or the activity that may be causing some stress or distress. And then I just ask myself, what is the lesson to be learned at that moment? What can I learn from this experience that can help me move through it and prepare for something similar that will occur probably again? And I try to move through this journey with those lessons. And that is what I'm hoping to bring to any work that I do with young people, because I believe that we're, life is about experiencing uncomfortable situations and how we respond to them can help make our lives better, more comfortable or whatever. How we respond helps to dictate how we will be, be. So I bring in that resiliency for me. That's how I move throughout my space and hope to enlighten those that I get to interact with, with that same sense of awareness. Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you. Wow. Yeah. I, um, I have a similar practice. I think that, um, you know, I would say that ritual is 
how I uh, incorporate or integrate resiliency into my daily work. Um, by definition, my work is about building systems. So processes, programs, procedures, things that work, but I'm using the elements of the visual arts, literary arts, healing arts, um, performing arts, in order to ensure that there's equity in terms of the message and the medicine that art provides. And so what I do is I am constantly defining things based on emergent strategy. And I use the book, Emergent Strategy, it's right here um, by Adrian Marie Brown, um, Emergent Strategy, Shaping Change, Shaping Worlds. In terms of, of what Kimberly uh, Cheatham referred to is just using your daily life practice and experiences to learn from them and then to then emerge into what we consider the highest or the higher part of ourselves after having just experienced this thing. It's an ongoing transformation. Um, it's an ongoing healing process. And when I think about the word resilience in general, that means that there is some need to heal or transform. Otherwise, that word wouldn't exist. So in terms of defining um, what, what, what's happening each day, day by day, and then allowing that thing to emerge into something new each day is how I incorporate resilience into my practice and my work. Thank you. Thank you, Angel. Next question, still pertaining to resiliency, is as a teaching artist, artist, arts administrator, whose work is focused on providing audiences or students, youth, pathways for exploring challenging, hard emotions, what are important things to keep in mind when engaging with audiences on this topic of resiliency? And I realize, and I'm not trying to, I know I, keep, I'm not, I know it sounds very broad and that's not my intention. I know very much everyone has a kind of a specific way of approaching it and specific focus. Um, but how do you foster this space for inclusivity and um, you know, experimentation and creativity with the audience who's either are participating in your programs or reviewing your works? So when um, I'm engaging audiences on that topic of resiliency, um, I start with my students by telling them that they have every single thing that they could ever need to create their work. And to me, that is transformative to some of the students. Sometimes you can see the light bulb go off immediately when you give them the license to create whatever it is that they want to create. So um, it just gives them space to, to move around in their projects. I bring them the structure, whether it's a pattern or whether it's a process, and I give them the flexibility to do whatever they want to fulfill whatever it is in their, their practice or their um, purpose. So I bring the space and then I bring the thunderous applause as well, because that is healing. And I encourage everybody to bring the thunderous applause as well. Um, and sometimes what they do, it, it doesn't really make sense to me, but who am I to say that it's not art? If they say it's art, it's art. And if it's in the world, it's in the world. And I'm happy that I was able to be a vessel to help them create their, their projects, their beauty, their art. Kimberly, I resonate with that so much. <laughs> I am not, no one would ever pay me for the art that I create. I, I've stopped saying that I'm not an artist, but I, I, I don't think I can earn money doing creating art. So I'll just leave it at that. But what you've said is exactly what the Just Us program attempts to do and communicate to the youth that we serve. They possess the keys internally. They have everything that they need to do what they need to do and getting them to believe that and embrace that and dig deep 
is what we are seeking to do, um, the gift we hope to give with our program. If I could list the components that are important to the Just Us initiative, I would be number one, being flexible. It starts with a vision. I bring people to the table. We collaborate, I bring inclusiveness to the table. The people that I partner with represent or serve students that are from underserved populations, varying abilities, as well as majority populations because we are attempting to build community as well. And you, you have to go outside of your comfort zone in order to build those skills and refine those rough areas. So it takes us being a little bit uncomfortable to become a better version of ourselves. So we have a diverse team that we work with to implement and to bring the vision to life. And Oftentimes that end product does not represent the initial concept that I may have had, but it's still beautiful nonetheless. And it represents something that was meaningful to the artist at the time. And so therefore it's beautiful to me as well. Um, in addition to being flexible, I think it's important to understand that we all are on different parts of our journey. So, Someone may just be beginning their process and I need to respect that as well and allow for that space and allow them to work through their own personal processes. It's not intended to be therapy, but we do want to have conversations that can be meaningful and cause them to think introspectively about what might be possible if they just open up just a little bit. The other thing is it must be fun. Our art is just a tool to connect students with the larger lesson. So we're using art to make it attractive, to talk about empathy, to talk about things that are important in order to get along with other people. And so we want it to be fun, very light, mindless activities that will allow them to accomplish the art yet hear the conversation and think while they're engaging. And then we always include a reflection component. Um, it has to have some way for them to be able to move the work, the activity, the conversation beyond the actual art itself. We want it to live beyond the time that we have with them. Um, so I'm not the artist. We're creating the program and working with community partners and schools to deliver the content to the students. So the, stu the teachers, the after-school programming teams, they are the ones who know their children and know the youth that they're working with. So their input is very important. We're very flexible in terms of how each, each site's product may look different because they know the audience that they're working with. And the last thing I would say is that we try to anchor our activities into something larger than just our project. So the first initiative anchored the activity with our 1898 monument here in Wilmington, our campus monument in Wilmington. And then the most recent activity connected or used as a focal point, the AIDS Memorial Quilt. So even though they were doing an art project, there was something larger than this art project that will help them to become critical thinkers and thinking about something other than what is immediately impacting them. Thank you. I would say that in terms of audience um, building and audience connection, it's, it's still going back to both Kimberly and Kimberly um, with regard to lived experience. Um, one of the things I think is really important is to understand what people's lived experience is, number one, um, because I wanna know, I wanna know what your lived experience is on an individual basis, as well as what your individuality and the next person's individuality and everybody in the room's individuality does to make up 
the collective, to make up the room. And that's what uh, Adrienne Marie Brown refers to in emergent strategy in terms of the conversation in the room. The people who make up this conversation right now are the only ones who can have this particular conversation. So what are those elements, right? And the way that I have been able to demonstrate uh, what a conversation in the room looks like is from that first event called the experiment. Um, it was called the experiment because we were, we were focusing this around HIV cure research, but also each artist, we invited artists to help us engage our audience members. And so the question was, how do we get people to come to an event talking about HIV of all things? We decided that we needed to bring in hip hop. We need to bring in music in terms of song. We needed to bring in um, a spoken word artist who was also a hip hop artist, but had this, this flexibility and agility around the arts. And we also brought in a visual artist to live paint, to paint what was happening in the room. So it goes back to this part about artistic expression, creative expression in some way. We wanted people to be present in the room with their lived experience with themselves. And so we were able to identify things that would relate to our target audience. So we needed black men in particular um, to be here as a part of this conversation because that was what the goal of the researcher was. And I said, okay, well, HIV, hip hop, we're gonna have to do that. And so um, the next thing, once we, once we were able to secure that, I said, we have to make people part of the process. And the reason why we're using hip hop is because there's, you know, hip hop is known for its free form, um, people freestyle and, you know, rap from the top of the dome as they say, right? Mm -hmm. And so that is, you know, an intuitive, of energy that people are able to release in, in ways that might be rough, like turbulence, but you hit this moment where all the elements come together and there you are with this freestyle. So we see it in the best battle rappers. We see it, um, KRS-One is one of my favorite like freestyle um, MCs. And what we did was we said, this is how we're going to make our audience a part of the process. And that's how we promoted it and communicated about the event until it happened. And so by the time the event rolled around, which on a Monday, December 14th, we had a room full of people. It was, a, we were at capacity around HIV cure research. And it was because we wanted to have, we wanted to get their feedback. So we needed to make them a part of the creative process about whatever was gonna happen in the room. And so the host who was a spoken word artist and the MC uh, or the, the hip hop MC led after the presentation by the researcher, the two of them led the room through this process, dropping out words, phrases, things that made you think about HIV cure research. And then the MC, the hip hop MC and the vocalist who had been experimenting together because each of the artists were experimenting too with new mediums um, that they were working with to continue their process in, in their art. And so the vocalist and the hip hop MC perform this song and use a loop pedal to repeat various words that were said, created patterns and rhythms with that, and basically told the audience's story back to them in that moment. And so this is, again, it's emergent strategy. It's what happens in the room, what can become this thing when we bring all of our frame of references or our lived experiences together as the collective. And in that moment, we become one and we'll all leave with this next level of understanding about 
the topic in mind, but also about the other people in the room having a better tolerance, a better understanding and empathy for the other folk who are in the room. Some of the information that we heard was really hard to hear, but because we had created that environment, people were vulnerable enough to share the truth. And we were able to influence that research um, for this particular researcher. And um, as a result, uh, the, the researcher was able to establish that day, December 14th, as a city of Durham holiday, HIV Cure Research Day, December 14th, and then went on to establish that as a state of North Carolina uh, proclama uh, proclamation. And so I take audience very seriously in the sense that we are looking for, like, what is the emergent strategy in the room? What's the conversation in the room? And I think that is what allows us to go from resilience to what I say is healing and transformation. Thank you. Thank you, Angel. That was great. Well, we're going to take a kind of a short pause between questions and actually I'm going to turn it back over to you, Angel, if you'd like to share your presentation with the participants and then we'll um, move on to some more questions. Um. I was on mute. Sure, I'm, I'll show this um, presentation. It should be pretty um, short toward the end. There are a couple things I'll explain, but we've talked about quite a few of these things already. So I'll skim through those pretty fast. So um, let me know if I'm moving too fast and I'll be happy to slow down. Here we go. How's that? Is it everybody's able to see this? Okay. And so, um, with regard to integrating resiliency and in, uh, intercultural connections and in teaching artistry, I want to talk specifically about the fact that I decided, uh, under the amazing leadership of Dr. Lenora Helm Hammonds, to declare my conceptual teaching artistry as um, a person who focuses on community development or building as well as urban planning. So I wanna share just a couple of, of definitions. And before I do that, I, want, I do wanna acknowledge the land. Um, that's an important thing. One of the things about urban planning is uh, a term called land use. And I will go into that after I talk, acknowledge the land that I'm on. Um, so here we go. I want to give honor and respect to the Okanichi Band of the Saponi Nation. I live on and am presenting from the throughway from the Tuscarora people. And this particular block of land, even if you use the GPS right now, you'll see um, Tuscaloosa, a word Tuscaloosa pop up on your map oftentimes. And the Tuscaloosa people were people who moved around in the form of a clock. And there was this natural um, uh, nomadic migration effort that they did. And it there's, there's uh, research that shows that they moved around in this formation in a circle, constantly giving and receiving from the land but also learning from these, these new things that the last tribe of people left behind. And as a result, they were able to continue to build um, their knowledge and learn from one another by inhabiting the land, the last group of people um, from their nation uh, inhabited. So I wanna give honor to the Okanichi Band of the Saponi Nation, the Tuscarora and the Tuscaloosa people. Um, we've gone into uh, my, my introduction, but I just want to call out the concepts around urban planning and designing, um, especially as it relates to the experiment, the event that I just talked about. So the concepts here um, that I work with in terms of how Kimberly works with textiles and materials um, are, again, concepts in terms of identity, community, conflict and adversity, which is 
resilience, freedom and social change, as well as progress. And so what I use is to find out, to find the conversation in the room, I use what we've all seen in ways, the five senses. Um, I've added a sixth sense on here in the sense that there is a ritualistic spiritual aspect to the work. Um, in order to recognize uh, ways to transform and heal, I believe there has to be uh, a sixth sense to that in terms of being able to use other parts, the unseen um, or the uncommon in order to solve societal ills. And so this uh, just basically talks about the shift in power dynamics toward healing um, when we are able to acknowledge that people have been displaced uh, and that they're, when people are displaced or marginalized or pushed to the margins, um, now what we're calling the global majority, we recognize that there are so many systems, so many ways of being or rites of passage that are lost or confused or people just don't know anymore. And so this design allows for people to remember, to remember the place of cultural abundance that they come from, and that helps to restore the sense of belonging. And so um, in Emergent Strategy, Adrienne Marie Brown talks about her mentor, Grace Lee Boggs, who was a civil rights uh, mover and shaker in Detroit, Grace constantly reminded her in order to transform yourself, you have, and so, I'm sorry, in order for you to transform the world or transform your community or whatever it is you're trying to transform, you have to transform yourself. And so knowing yourself through your senses is a really important thing because it does allow for us to have that conversation in the room. Uh, I just define resiliency here in the sense that it's the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties or toughness. Um, there's an elasticity. There is uh, a process that allows for growth to happen. When you can call yourself resilient, you are talking about that elasticity. You're talking about that level of growth. And I believe that artists are the people who help us see it in more concrete ways or ways that make sense, practical ways. That's important, um, especially for a person like me in terms of using spiritual and ritualistic um, methods to talk about traditional things like the arts, visual arts in, in all of those ways, because what that does is it provides an exchange um, in terms of the information, and again, both of us leave with this new frame of reference based on what we were able to provide to that frame of reference and what we were able to receive. I also define healing here, um, just the process of making or becoming sound or healthy again. And we know that, you know, with regard to resilience, there is obviously an opportunity to heal or a need to heal if we're even talking about the word uh, uh, resilient or resiliency. So one of the things that is really important to me, especially as a teaching artist and what teaching artists do, and I'll say this all day long, um, I learned this from watching, again, Dr. Lenora Helm Hammond perform. Um, I said, there's something different about this performance. There's something different about the way this jazz artist performs. And I had come to know, first of all, I saw the consistency in it, but it, I had come to know this person's a teaching artist. And I in, like instantly became interested in what teaching artistry is. So it's like, there's a method to this. It looks natural but there's a method to it. And so what I say um, with regard to teaching artistry, especially with how it allows me to do the work I do in community development and urban planning is that art makes social issues more concrete so that they can be addressed. They have to be addressed in order for those things to be healed. And healing 
is what I consider here an effective action that can be taken. So we're talking about all these things that plague society right now. We're talking about aging, climate, critique, and why critique is actually important and what the difference between critique and hate rate is. Um, we're talking about disparity. We're talking about disabilities, accessibility, inclusion. Um, why oftentimes people who are disabled are, they are an afterthought. Art allows us to see uh, disability and accessibility and inclusion from a completely different angle, but also allows it to be made concrete in your face, something that you can touch and move with. Um, gender identity, health, infrastructure, which is a big thing that we deal with um, with regard to community development and urban planning. And obviously the foundation for all this is racism, um, ethnic grouping, and identifying based on these social constructs. And so here is where, for me, I believe art opens a pathway to process. And that process leads to the embodiment of this thing. Again, that's a conversation in the room, the embodiment of it. The fact that we are being this change rather than performing it, rather than talking about it, rather than being able to say all the right words, use all the buzz language and make it trendy, especially with regard to activism and organizing becoming a more trendy thing and, and, and becoming more commercialized. That's the fastest way to kill a movement is to allow it to, to be trendy. And uh, this is a, a way to, first of all, acknowledge it so that you can use that and provide the converse. So um, one of the artists that I love and, and just really helped me get through the pandemic, the first part of the pandemic was uh, Ego LMA, who's a British um, R&B and jazz artist who loves Theo Croker. And um, she wrote a song called uh, Girls Don't Always Sing About Boys, Their Sustainability and Other Things to Talk About. And she says in the song, I raise the issue with the nice beat behind me. And you, you got to listen to the song. It's linked here uh, in the presentation. I want you all to, to listen to her say that particular phrase because it defines like who I am as a teaching artist. But I also would imagine that it would define the teaching artists here on this panel in general. The, what, it, what you do is pro, you provide this awareness of social issues, the issues that got you to this place um, that allow you to provide messaging for your audience in this way. And so I raise the issue with a nice beat behind me. I'll play just a little quick snippet of it just so y'all can. <laughs> Pause it there. 
Um, but you hear her talking about mental health issues. She's talking about homelessness. Later on in the song, she talks about sustainable fashion and the innovations that have come about because of necessity. Um, she talks about same-sex loving, um, which is a term that was used before uh, we've known the term LGBTQ+. Um, with regard to the spiritual aspects and the origin of same-sex loving is actually, you know, it's actually found in, in Africa. And I, this is not what this presentation is about, but it uh, the fact that, you know, Ego LMA or an artist in general is bringing this uh, information to light, this message to light for people provides healing for folk who are experiencing the things that she's singing about. Um, um, there we go. Um, teaching artists are also able to translate and interpret language for all kinds of people. And one of the things um, I'll talk about toward the end, this is one of the last slides um, with regard to the talking part, uh, is with urban planning I um, and the particular project, Be Connected Durham's Fayetteville Street Corridor Fellows Project. This is the area that's also known as the Haytai community in Durham, um, the Tuscaloosa block, the Tuscarora people by way of the Okanichi uh, band of the Saponi Nation. In terms of the work that we've done, so it looked like this big celebration or these third Friday events, this Juneteenth event. But what happened in between is that we were meeting with the engineers, the technicians, the consultants for the Better Bus Project because we needed the bus system to be better in our community. One of the pieces of feedback that we would get when we go out and canvas in between these events was that people had to keep their jobs during the pandemic. They were working jobs where they were not making $15 an hour. And because the bus was not on time, they couldn't rely on it. And most of the time, these are people who live in what's called zero car households. That means there may not be a car to this household. They may rely on rides from other people. They probably rely on public transit. And so um, the feedback led to, well, we just, you take an Uber. And so I asked, the question, well, what does an Uber cost to get from this place to that place? And they told me between 15 and $20 one way. Now I've experienced that before. I take Uber or Lyft. And so I was like, well, if you're going to a job that doesn't pay you that amount of money just to be able to get there on time so that you're not fired, what does like how what does that do to your stress levels and the various things in terms of how you how do you get over how do you make it day to day and so uh they shared that they have to keep this job in order to keep the other benefits that they are receiving um whether it be again zero car households might be in communities uh, of public housing um they might be in affordable housing communities they may be in um various types of households where people do need to rely on public transit, but that system doesn't work in their particular neighborhood in the way that it might work in a, a neighborhood where there, there's more access to funding, um, tax dollars, and, and the like. And so I uh, saw this piece this is just recently. So I added this to the presentation recently and I thought it was perfectly timed. Um, it's written by Kaisha Jennings who works with the North Carolina Arts Council and is an amazing uh, thought leader, an amazing writer, um, someone who loves hip hop and loves being herself, someone that I admire and respect so much um, from the beginning of us just being on the same Twitter chats with hip hop ed and so forth. And when I say that teaching artists are able to translate and interpret language for all kinds of people, this is what I mean. When we're in these meetings with the engineers, with language and jargon that we don't understand ourselves, we're able to say, so what does that mean? So that when I talk to our neighbors about this Better Bus project, 
survey, I can translate this information and then I can come back to you to say, this is how you need to engage community around it. This is how this project is gonna be successful and stands the test of time without all the pushback if you had just, just had them wake up one morning and they discover you digging a hole in front of their uh, yard in the way that that has happened. Um, so this particular uh, article that Kaisha wrote describes this with uh, the importance of critique and the importance of exchange, an honest exchange between two parties who are trying to resolve a problem. Again, in the way that art solves problems, y'all, like art is the messenger. It give you, gives you all these frames of reference to use in order to provide healing transformation or change. And so this article in particular, and it's linked here, um, just so you all will be able to have access to it. But basically it talks, it, the title is how Kendrick Lamar holds the culture to task on the heart part five. Uh, Kaisha goes in to talk about how this is actually a critique of the culture in the sense that Black people um, call our culture. Our culture is very important and it's very influential. We all know that. Um, but taking these elements and allowing a person who has achieved the status of what we see in terms of the status quo or the mainstream achieve that level to share a voice and while a lot of hip hop artists have not chosen to use their voice to uh, provide this kind of messaging, Kendrick Lamar at what society would be called at the top of the, uh, the hierarchy in the sense of his artistry is offering this very thoughtful critique in this song and in the video, which I'll show, um, he is, he's showing and also telling you what this message is and why it's really important at such a time as this. So this will be pretty much the end of this presentation. We won't go through the whole video. It's about five, six minutes long. And then I'm gonna just go into just some pictures I'll show you in terms of like the work um, in terms of urban planning that I've just talked about. So here we go. As I get a little older, I realize life is perspective, and my perspective may differ from yours. I want to say thank you to everyone that's been down with me. All my fans, all my beautiful fans. Anyone who's ever gave me a lesson. All my people. I come from a generation of pain will murder his minor. Rebellious and more jealous a trip you for designer. Belt buckles and cloud over zealous and prone to violence. Make the wrong turn. Be the will of will alignment. Residue burn. Miss that in the city. Miscommunication to keep homo detector busy. No protection is risky. Desensitized. I vandalize pain. Covered up and camouflage. Get used to hearing arsenal rain. Analyze. I'm going to stop it right there because um, I, I know you, you get the gist and I want to uh, just wrap up in the sense that um, in terms of being able to translate difficult information and again, make language, make various things more concrete so that there is an opportunity to take your art higher, but also to solve problems and dissolve societal tension art is the way to go. And that is why teaching artists are so important in, in various ways. But in this non-traditional sense, urban planning and community development, it's the reason why I do the work and how I do it, um, because this is the, the ultimate way to get the messaging across to all people, for all people to be able to go to this collective higher place. Wow, that was so powerful, Angel. I almost hate to have you wrap up. Uh, you could have an, an entire session just with what you've laid down today. Wow, that's just powerful. And I and it made me think of, 
I, I wrote down the book Emergent Strategies. I'm, I'm going to make sure and pick that up. And um, it, it made me, what you were sharing about context, providing context for um, diverse perspectives, it affirms all voices. And so that the lens that with that we use can be acclimated for different apertures for different voices to to be seen and heard by all the participants in a particular setting that you know i i think as, as simply as musicians we often have music on in the background while we're studying or working we might have a musician, a live video on of musicians performing and have the sound down, but be talking or writing, you know, something so that that is a room for us, you know, as we create and it provides a certain um, acknowledgement of that's our land at the moment, right? If you see a musician huddled over a, a tablet or in the corner on their guitar in the airport, that is a, an acknowledgement right there. And so these ways of looking differently at uh, create the creation process, and I love that you talk about um, your, your ideals for systematizing processes so that we can look at what it means for a zero car household to uh, be recalcitrant about a survey but once they understand, oh yeah, you can dig a hole in my yard. If it's going to mean that it's going to change the way I can move about my neighborhood or get from one side of the city to the other, um, it's it's always about about that. Um, and sometimes the traditional settings that we find ourselves as teaching artists don't fit all of the cor the cultural uh, isms that we need and. And I want to lead us into the next couple of questions quickly. And uh, Kimberly and Kimberly, um, if you can respond as you in the in the questions to what Angel just shared with us too, so that we can be intentional about the time we have left. Um, so the, the question number three is: As a teaching artist working in several contexts. How do you embed and or honor those connections to multicultural expressions? Now, realizing that multicultural, the word, is a highly contested moniker in arts education circles, you know, vis-a-vis uh, -vis intercultural. So you have multiculturalism within brown uh, settings of brown people, right? Um, but intercultural means that people who are very different and, and, and from you. Uh, please define how you view the word and thus your engagement to diverse audiences. I think you're muted, Kimberly Cartwright. You have to unmute yourself. There you are. Yeah, I think my goal in this whole thing was not to uh, be muted when I was talking. So I, I failed in that respect <laughs> miserably, <laughs> um, always on Zoom. So um, I, my goal in this is to have each student to bring like their, their unique expressions um, that they experience during our sessions. I want them to bring with them from their culture, anything they would like to incorporate specifically in their pieces in the process. It could be a picture of their family. Um, it could be something from their beautiful treasure chest. It could be something from the Bible, um, articles of clothing that we can harvest from and my quilting just lends a base for people to tell their stories. I want them to tell their stories from their heart, from, from whatever art pieces that they're working on. And I think then when they tell their own stories, they um, solidify their history with their own um, truths. 
And it um, gives my students like the opportunity to draw from their culture to do that. Um, when I look at multiculturalism, it's like really hard for me because um, I'm African American and I live in Western tradition. So my upbringing in this country has a Western like background and um, I'm African American and I'm always looking for anchors in Africa that I can relate to. And that it's a painful journey for me every single day, looking for mother Africa. And I'm put here by racist people who don't want me to be here after enslavement. So much, much of my multiculturalism has been erased in African Americans. We, we have like certain folk ways that are derived from multiculturalism, but there is so much information that's missing, like our language, our lineage, our family tree. So when I hear the word, I want um, more connection to Africa for Black people to be able to, to speak our truths over generations. Thank you. Wow. Yes. Kimberly Cheatham. I'll add that our work, the projects that we've done thus far are utilizing art teachers who are in the classroom and we give them the liberty to implement the projects the way that they deem appropriate. So we're not We're thankful that the instructors have that appreciation for our various backgrounds and the products or the materials that we use are intentionally readily accessible materials so that the students can replicate the projects that we're creating collectively, independently, once they're no longer in that setting. It's intentionally derived that way, but we give the students with our most recent project doing quilts of all things, we used, um, made tissue paper quilts using Maya Freelon was here to do that. And building tissue paper quilts using as a frame of reference the AIDS memorial quilt and having the students do their own individual panels with just with their, whatever guidance, whatever was guiding their journey to, to develop their individual panel spoke to what was important to them. So we don't give any guidance to the teachers that when we're talking about our projects um, all of our teachers are so much a part of what we believe in at the core. We don't have to have that conversation. It's just us around the table developing this project. It's a beautiful project and our, the results are just moving, um, just moving pieces of art that speak volumes and the students allow us into their, their worlds just by what they create and the reflective pieces, their art talks that they were they really they record um, that we get to listen to, those moments are just special. And I think that we ask them to talk about what's important to them. And by doing that, they tell us what means most to them. Thank you. I'm gonna uh, ask the next question, but again, fold into your answer, anything from previous. And Angel, if you could lead us into the first response to this question, that would be great. Um, <clears throat> intersectionality. Um, so do you encounter a request in your work for intersectionality with your audiences and or presenters with whom you engage? So specifically, 
How do you address or prepare or create programming or audience engagement activities focused on let's say the intersection of community leaders who are LGBTQ plus and or seniors who may have um, hearing impaired or other intersections of diverse audiences where someone has created a carton and you either push back or you, how do you deal with that? Mm. I, um, I try to be intentional upfront about that if I'm doing something, doing an event that especially like list um, one of those intersections, I use somebody's lived experience. If it's not mine, I think that's really important to do in general. And so I want to make sure that I have somebody who is a, a collaborator, an artist who is focused on uh, LGBTQ plus uh, rights, energy, art, um, or someone who is uh, hard of hearing. Or uh, so, so someone who is has that lived experience, or also has the, the lived experience of um, working in that environment, whether it be from a community um, leadership position or a uh, neighborhood leadership position, in the way that we 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 encounter those things. Um, I would say that when I'm caught off guard or I'm unprepared my approach is really to listen and to find the lived experience in the person. And it's important for me to be grounded in that moment too, because if there's pushback um, or someone's created this, this carton, I wanna make sure that I'm, also, I'm listening, but that I'm also not taking in information that could be, um, that could, could continue to per perpetuate harm in the sense that this might not be the most balanced um, argument, but this person ex is expressing themselves. So what do I see in between the lines in what they're expressing and how do I make that information, what this person, what I've received from this person whole in the sense that I'm learning something from it. So I'll go back and ask people and, do some research in the various things. So that's, that can be a very tough situation, especially when you don't see it coming. So that would be my response. Love that, love that. Either of the Kimber Kimberly Cheatham or Cartwright, can you feel free to jump in? So when I listen to um, Angel give her presentation, one thing that I took from it was take your art higher dissolve societal tension. So I think that that's a statement that'll help me in my growth in my art um, process. And then you asked um, a part of the question as it related to the LGBT community. And when you talk about um, subjects around sexuality, it's always a, diff a difficult conversation because there, there's so many people with so many views about it and then there there's hate that that it's um embroiled in a lot of times and as um, a teaching artist when i'm talking about um specifically the lgbtq community the first thing that i do is i um acknowledge people's pronouns and i i want to know how people want to be addressed and after i find out how they want to be addressed then i go about my usual presentation because the LGBT community, like any other population, have uh, they have the same needs as anybody else. They need shelter, they need food, they, they need whatever they need, what everybody else needs. So I, I really try to, to respect people in my classes in every way that I possibly can. And I try to treat people the way I want to be treated. And I, I help them through. My exercise is just like anybody else with equality. And I think, um, you know, after you get the pronoun straight, then everything else is just a matter of humanity. I'm, I'm talking to people. I'm not talking to their sexuality. And um, um, you talked about like the, the hearing impaired community too. I have not had a whole lot of uh, 
of experience with people who are, are hearing impaired in communities. But um, in my planning, I only had like maybe one student, but my approach to that was because I knew that they were, were capable. So to find out how I could work through their capabilities, I made sure that my lesson plans were given to them in advance so that they could follow along with a, a sheet of paper. And I made sure that I monitored them very well in the class so they wouldn't fall behind. And I encouraged them to let them know that if there was trouble, if there was a problem, that we could work through the process and I would be there to help them even after the exercise. So um, making way for people and, and seeing who they are as humans, I think helps the process. It is the process as far as I'm concerned in, in teaching my art. I'll add that. We've been selected, we've had the opportunity to select our partners, the specific classrooms, teachers who will be helping to implement our projects, a special ed teacher, the, the art teachers are middle and elementary school teachers and the after school programs are um, diverse and serving varied populations. And um, two of our Three of our most recent partnerships were with programs that catered to students with varying disabilities. So we've been fortunate in looking at our programming with the lens that's very inclusive. The educator that writes, that has written both of the curriculums is a trained special educator. So I, I think that our process moving forward, because we have had requests from organizations to be a part of our programming, we will have to rethink how we shape our spaces and be more intentional about setting the tone, because we've been very fortunate in having people at the table who we don't need to preach that message to the to the to those who are in attendance, because we we just wanted people who were helping us advance our cause, our mission. But in our processes moving forward, we are rethinking how we can be more inclusive by opening up to people who are um, just to people who want to do this work with us. So we will see what that looks like. But I'm very anxious because I, I like what Angel said about listening to everyone and everyone does have a voice. And it's very important to me. It's interesting how you're able to, to include everyone who's participating and there is room for that, it's needed. So that will be what I take away from this and my next, next step. Thank you. Thanks so much. This is um, really ex exciting to hear the, the very, different but very similar ways that you each are addressing the intersections of your audiences and your perspectives about how you allow and um, facilitate uh, expression and acknowledgement of everyone who could be in front of you, your audiences and yourselves, because we know that as teaching artists, when you teach, you learn twice. And um, when you were speaking, uh, Kimberly, about you, you allow, you look for and listen to the pronouns or how do you want to be addressed? How do you want to be served? I remember working with a group of deaf dancers in New York and their uh, <laughs> deaf, ja deaf dance jam workshop was the name of the company. And they were dancers and they were deaf and they would, and I, when I was called to work with them, I was like, well, I don't know what to do, you know, and, and my, and my peer, my colleague, she said, well, um, first of all, they may, um, they may put their hands around your, your, your neck to feel the vibration when you're singing. And they take, they dance with their shoes off to feel the vibration of the music and the drums on the floor and they count. And it was so profoundly um, impactful to, to realize, oh, my box was small 
And it was about just being able to be taught and, and learn. So that resiliency that you each spoke about is very, very um, courageous and powerful. I really thank you, each of you, for speaking to that. And, and before I pass it off to um, my colleague Kathleen, is there any other moment or comment that any any of our panelists, Angel, Kimberly Cheatham, or Kimberly Cartwright, want to add as we look for any questions that might be in our Q and A? No, I don't have anything to add. I, I just I definitely got some really great reminders in terms of pronouns. I needed, I needed to hear that out loud, um, making sure that I'm focused on that. And also just with regard to what Kimberly said about um, rethinking, you, you actually have me rethinking about rethinking. And I, I think that that's the beauty of, of what the room does is we are able to give and receive in a way that we walk away from the space. Like, to go higher and I'm just really grateful for that so I just want to say thank you for allowing me to be a part of this panel it, it's been the best part of my week so far except I voted yes I echo that it's been a wonderful time spending this moment with you all I've learned and I feel felt so I'm I'm full so thank you so beautiful. Thank you very, very much for joining us. My partner in crime here, Kathleen, why don't you come and tell us some, some things that we can share with our audience about cartwheels? Definitely, definitely. And again, I just want to say thank you, Kimberly, Angel, and Kimberly. This was, I too have learned so much in today's webinar sessions. And these, it's amazing how the time flies. I, I, I would love to keep on the conversation and discussion. So thank you so much for your time and participation today. We really appreciate it. Um, yes, so as Lenora mentioned, um, I just wanted to spend a, just a couple of minutes. I won't take up too much time because I know not everybody wants to talk about grants at five in the clock in the afternoon, but um, I wanted to share with our teaching artists, and please also share with your networks that the North Carolina Arts Council, we have two opportunities specifically um, with teaching artists and artists in mind. So I'm going to briefly share my screen and just take you to the North Carolina Arts Council website so I can kind of direct you where you can find more information. And I'll also make sure to include my contact details in the chat because I'm more than happy to schedule a time after this webinar to go over any of these um, grants or applications I'm about to share with. I love connecting with artists in the state and hearing more about your work and ways that we can promote um, partnerships throughout the state and community. So bear with me one second. Let me share my screen. All righty. Okay. Let's see. Hmm. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I have two monitors up. I want to make sure you're easy the website and not a fun spreadsheet. <laughs> Great. Okay, so um, I'm first going to take you to information. So here's our website, ncarts.org. And if you go to grants and then grants for artists, you will see um, all our artists opportunity grants. So the one I'm going to focus on first is here, the Cartwheels Grant Program Teaching Artists Roster. Just a little bit of background information about this program. It's called Cartwheels with the intention that it's very much, it's going out into the state. We try to make sure we're reaching um, a lot of our tier one or tier two counties, a lot of our rural counties um, who may not have as many arts organizations or resources near them, but it's really, it's open to any school or school district. During the pandemic, we paused Cartwheels. We all, A, given the times, you know, artists couldn't even go into schools, everything was virtual, but we also took that opportunity to really take the time to intentionally reevaluate the program. So I'm really excited to relaunch it, and we're hoping going forward that cartwheels will be a way that we can ensure that we are addressing current issues current challenges that may be being faced by students 
and our school communities in the state. So I say that and that our hopes and our intention is that every four, three to four years, we'll probably do another call out for cartwheels artists um, with a new kind of proposal theme. So another piece about the cartwheels grant is we've had, we've had the roster, gosh, I think since about 2009 and there's been changes to it but I'm gonna make sure it's a lot more formalized and that there's, um, for lack of a better word, almost like term limits for the teaching artists on the roster. Um, they can always reapply, but it's kind of like a three-year commitment. But my goal is just to make sure that if there's teaching artists in the state that wanna have the opportunity to participate, there is more of that flexibility. And I should also say, I'm not the one making the decisions. In fact, Guest panelists, you may hear from me again. Um, <laughs> what my role is to help any artists with the application process, answer any questions about the program. But then we have um, panelists who will be made up of teaching artists as well as you know school educators to make the decision on um, reviewing the applications and who should be selected for the roster. So. The Car Rules Grant Program, what it is, is teaching artists, we will, our goal is to select about six to eight teaching artists or teaching artist groups to be on this, in this program. And then schools can apply to for a Car Rules Grant, which would provide all the funding to bring those artists into their schools. So I wanna say this is more focused for kind of um, a one or two day experience. It's typically pretty school wide. Um, and it includes usually some professional development for teachers as well. Our cartwheels artists in the past have loved this type of programming because they, they, they have honestly said it's made a huge impact on their practice, on their growth. Um, and you're working with all school, school communities in North Carolina. Just a few bits and pieces about it. This is just a general overview about the cartwheels grant program, the goals of the program, and then for this relaunching of it, we're going to focus on resiliency. So, so I wanted to make sure I got to bring it into today's discussion. We also chose this because um, my colleagues and I at the Arts Council have done a lot of listening sessions with schools. In all, you know, our goal was to try to connect with almost all 100 counties as best we could, as, long with, as well as with arts organizations that do a lot of school programming, working with artists that have school partnerships. So we spent most of the past year doing a lot of listening and constantly it was resiliency that came up. That students need, we, as we addressed today, the arts provide this vehicle for students to process and to be able to, I think, I think what I kept on hearing from schools is like, we need to address what's happened. <laughs> we can't just go back in and expect everything to be okay. Our students, they won't, succeed academically or outside of the school if we don't allow, provide a space for processing. So we're really excited to focus on this topic. And I think it can, it's gonna have some very meaningful impact. I also know as the grant manager for this program, I, I know I wanna make sure we're very supportive for, of our teaching artists as well. Cause I, I realize this is a lot of difficult work and I just know that we too, as part of being on the roster, will provide some professional development and peer networking and peer kind of engagement sessions throughout the period of the guardrails grant. So, um, so this is all the information. Information we obviously want to support North Carolina artists. So I do want to make clear you you do need to be based in North Carolina to apply for this uh, specific to be on the roster. Um, we provide some additional information, kind of program parameters. And um, my wonderful colleague Eileen has created like a PDF version of all this that you can easily print out and kind of even like a checklist for the application that you can go through. So I won't go into the nitty gritty details, but if accepted onto the roster, um, cartwheels artists can receive anywhere between $3,000 to $15,000 for each of their school performances. So we just really want to break down of understanding what the cost would go towards. It can certainly help with any travel. Because if remember, North Carolina is a big state, so it would be going all over the state. So help with any travel, lodging, materials, costs, um, just items, items like that. Last thing I'll mention, um, it, it does have this kind of school-wide um, focus. 
So we've had a lot of uh, dance organizations and theater groups. I really want to make sure we have all our, you know, or as, you know, genres represented. We certainly have worked with visual artists before with the Cartwheels program. A lot of times it's also making sure kind of their, their practice has a performance piece to it. So however you can make the case that yes, my project could reach a significant number of students, I think we're really open to kind of experimenting and exploring different projects we could take into schools. So um, like I said, all this is here. It even includes the review criteria. That's what we'll, um, our panelists, our guest panelists will go through and review applications based on. Um, and all, all of this here, so kind of what the application information, I'm, I clearly list like what the questions are in the application. So uh, this is now up and open and the deadline is July 31st. And anyone who is interested in just scheduling a one-on-one -on -one with me, I'm more than happy to answer more specific questions about kind of expectations for the program and um, any questions you may have about the application process as well. So that is, we're really excited. Schools are really excited. They have missed this type of programming. Um, I'm sure many of you who work with schools realize that staff capacity is an issue right now. And so the Cartwheels Grant is more of a package program, but we work really hard to ensure depth is very much a, a serious component of the program as well. So um, I know teachers and school administrators keep on asking me when it's going to be launched. So it's happening. <laughs> um, finally, the other grant I do want to share that's open for individual artists or will be open soon is our artist support grant. And this grant category was created in direct response to the pandemic is we, as a state arts agency, we paused our fellowship program, artist fellowship program for the time being and reallocated the funding to the artist support grant. Realizing there was no perfect answer during the pandemic, but our goal was we thought as a state agency, we wanted to help and provide support to as many artists as we could while the fellowship program was more of like only 20 artists. But through the artist support grant, we've been able to provide kind of micro grants to hundreds of artists in the state and in all counties of North Carolina. So for this specific one, we give funding to local arts councils who then kind of re-grant it out to, your, to the artists in their counties. So feel free definitely to check it out. We'll be updating this web page very, very soon. Um, the artist support grants typically open in the late summer. So I just wanted to let artists know that that is out there and it's fantastic. Funding can go towards creation of new work, you know, buying materials, equipment, supplies, professional development workshops, um, you name it. And a, a really cool piece about this is I believe about 50% of the grant can also go directly to pay you for your time. So it doesn't, you know, sometimes you don't see that admin cost is a lot smaller sometimes than other grants. But we were really excited to ensure that, you know, artists are <laughs> receiving a stipend as well for all their hard work and for this project creation. So um, I'll go ahead and stop sharing now. I realize it's a lot of info, but um, definitely, you know, check both of these opportunities out. And I'm more than happy to discuss in more detail as well at a later date. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathleen. It's amazing that Cartwheels is open again. I'm so excited. I cannot wait to share that with my teaching artists. Um, and spread the word. If you know teaching artists that you work with or peers who need information that we shared today, we still are the best kept secret in the state. Um, the NCCU's Teaching Artist Certificate Program has cohorts that start in fall and spring, so there's still time to enroll. And uh, we want to make sure all of our teaching artists in the state have great support and resources. But it's an online program, all online programs, so it doesn't matter where you live, you can access these resources. Our teaching artists today were amazing. I'm so grateful for you, Kimberly Cartwright, Angel Dozier, and Kimberly Cheatham. Um, Eileen and Anthony, we could not do this series without you. We started the series this spring wondering what it would be like uh, to come and return after the pandemic? And would there be a listening for these resources? Because we started this during the pandemic 
and it seems that we've had really good good response and we hope to continue it in the spring we'll take a little bit of a hiatus during the summer yay <laughs> but we'll be back and just stay in touch with us kathleen is there any other parting thing we want to say or need to share no, other than thank you again, guest panelists, and thank you, Dr. Lenora Helm Hammonds. I've enjoyed getting to work with you on Teaching Artist Tuesday. So I'm going to figure out a way to come bug you during the summer. So, oh, yes. <laughs> we're, this is. <laughs> we're, we're overdue for, for our beverages and that sounds great. <laughs> and, and brainstorming <laughs> sessions, beverages, B and B's. <laughs> that sounds great. That sounds great. Thank you all so much for your time and discussion today. We're so appreciative. I also want to share that Angel was uh, was very um, generous to share her PowerPoint in the chat. Will you drop that in one more time, just in case anyone missed it? There's lots of things that went in the chat. You can see this. Uh, this will be on the YouTube channel for the NCCU Teaching Artist Certificate Program YouTube channel and our Facebook page and on the North Carolina Arts Council page, right? So uh, we were live on YouTube today, so there will be there will be many times that you can share this with anyone who missed it. Thank you for all the participants who joined us today. You're welcome, and thank you. Thank you.